April Vokey, and you are listening to Anchored, my chance to speak with some of the most influential people involved in the outdoors today. Join me as I travel to sit face-to-face with my guests in their own homes to learn more about their careers, opinions, history, relationships, and life both indoors and out. Oliver White has one of the most inspirational stories I've ever heard. As owner of Abaco Lodge in the Bahamas, he didn't just accidentally land there. In this episode of Anchored, I sit down with Oliver to learn more about how he got to where he is today. I was born in Boone, North Carolina, which is the western part of North Carolina. My father was career military, so I was a really nomadic child. So oh. until I was, you know, around 10, we moved every year and a half or two years at the longest. And so we lived in Oklahoma and Georgia and Maryland and Germany and all over. Did you have one spot in particular that really just felt like home? <clears throat> North Carolina has always been home. So we would always go back to Boone for the holidays and everything. So as, that's as close to anything as being home. And then my father took a permanent station in North Carolina. So I did middle school and high school in Clayton, North Carolina, just outside of Raleigh. And then I went to college in Chapel Hill, which isn't far from there. Oh, okay. So you were able to settle for a little bit. Yep. Kind of. So yeah, middle school and high school. So, you know, from kind of 10 till 17 and then college, stayed in North Carolina. And then I left and I just moved back in the last couple of years. Okay. And what about the fishing side of things? Did he fish? My dad does not fish. It sounds like he's really busy. Was he gone a lot of the time? Yeah. It, you know, he, yeah. I mean, my dad worked really hard when we were kids and put in long hours I and mean, often would be, you know, off on assignment, deployment, whatever. Mm-hmm. And so there would be months and months where he wasn't around at all. So how did the fishing start? Well, my dad was a big outdoorsman, so we did a lot of camping and hiking and canoeing, and uh, my grandfather first took us fishing, not fly fishing, just full bottom fishing for catfish and things like that. Yeah. And uh, and ever since I was a kid, I, I always loved to fish. Like I would run around in the creeks and fish for little horny heads with just a cane pole on corn, and uh, my mom's brothers fly fish. And so when I was a teenager, I got a fly rod, and, th- and I just kind of self-driven Started to do it. What kind of rod was it? No, like a full-on cheap Walmart special. <laughs> okay. Was fly fishing popular in that area of the South back then? No, not at all. No. I'm going to ask you your age. You don't have to answer it, but I don't. I can't 38. See okay. So you are still quite young, but you've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. So I started fly fishing as a teenager, and but I did everything. You know, I was rafting and rock climbing and skiing, just an avid outdoorsman, backpacking. I did all of that. And when I was in college... I had a really bad skiing accident, and I broke my back and my pelvis and my hip and a bunch of things. I missed a whole year of school. Oh, my God. And that was really, for me, the the moment that fly fishing kind of took over as the main thing that I could do. And part of that was driven from, as I was getting better, you know, I was in a back brace and a walker and at my parents' house and miserable, just going crazy. And I, I would walk outside in the yard uh, with my walker and cast the fly rod because it was one of like the few things I could do as kind of mental rehabilitation of, of anything. As I got better, you know, fly fishing became kind of the one activity that kind of took over for me. What were you taking in college? Uh, I have a philosophy degree. Do you, you know, that's not surprising. You have this really cool look about you and it's just it's grassroots and organic and it's real I think and everything you've said so far just isn't surprising and to have a philosophy degree just sounds so like up your alley yeah I think that's partly how you end up where you are right you have all these foundations that help create the person you are and you know those are the events that put me on this path and how I ended up here were you always you know like that kind of in touch with yourself or did you ever go through a period where you were just lost what the hell am i going to do yeah all the time like every year okay, like just constant existential crisis I yeah mean, that's part of life i think but always try to be you know reflective and push and you know try to get better i've always been pretty ambitious you know even as a young kid mm-hmm. so. so what did you want to be when you grew up you know when i originally when i was a little kid who knows but like even when i started college my plan was to go be an attorney what about that was appealing to you from an intellectual standpoint, man, I find law really fascinating still, right? I mean, I love forming arguments and making analysis and reading through things and, and solving problems. And, you know, when I was younger, probably even more liberal and kind of a go-getter, I thought you could kind of help make the world a better place. And You were into the corporate thing. 
No, not and not really from a corporate standpoint. I mean, more from like a social justice standpoint. But eventually, you did end up in the corporate world. Yeah, but that's not not till later. Yeah, not till later, and totally by accident. Let's talk about it. T- walk me through your timeline. I mean, so I'm an undergrad. I, I have two degrees. I have a philosophy and a history degree, both of which kind of set you up to go to law school. Okay, yeah. And kind of halfway through, I man, I got hurt, and and that really did kind of change my perspective of kind of what was important and what you want to do. And so as I finished school, I decided to take a year off before figuring out what I wanted to do. I'd already started guiding at that point. So I had an opportunity to kind of keep guiding. And uh, where, that, where were you guiding? Sorry to cut in, yeah, in Western North Carolina and Boone. Okay. Uh, so Western North Carolina has a bunch of really great small stream trout fishing. And then right over in Eastern Tennessee, you have the Watauga and the South Holston, which are really phenomenal tailwaters. The Nola Chucking, the new or Freestone Rivers for River Run Smallmouth. And so I was doing that. And the outfit I worked for had two brothers, and one of them did a wilderness float trip in Alaska, and one of them did a bone fishing school in the Bahamas. So I was able to go do both of those trips. That started the kind of the international or just travel in general. And kind of was doing that and enjoyed it and was doing well. And from that, got offered a job to go down and guide in Tierra de Fuego at Cal Taupin for Sea Run Browns. So I did that. And then I was down there and Somebody's like, well, you can't go back to North Carolina after guiding here. And they got me a job. This was Carter Andrews. Carter got me a job <laughs> in Jackson Hole where I'd never been. So I got back from Argentina. I got in my truck. I drove cross country to Jackson and started guiding there. Wow. So what time frame was this? This is like early 2000s. I graduated college. Okay, so you'd be in so, your 20s. Yep. Okay. So you were a, a guide. I mean, that's yep. how you made your income. Yeah. For several years, man, I did my summers in Jackson, my winters in Argentina and, you know, would guide 250 days a year. Did you like the nomadic life? Yeah. I mean, I've always done well with that. It was great. The, I mean, the real issue there was I never thought I would make a living forever as a guide, right? It was always just going to be a phase. And part of that was at 25 or whatever it was, you know, I was as busy as you could be. And that meant that was all you were ever going to make. That was going to be it, right? I mean, this was kind of peaking at 25. Didn't sound like a great idea. Yeah. So I always expected to quit and go back to school, whether to go get an MBA or a law degree or, and do a more traditional career. Right. So you didn't think that you could be a professional guide forever because you didn't think the money would work? You know, it, I like the job, but, you know, living in your truck and getting to these wonderful places and guiding every single day during the season, you know, isn't very conducive to, you know, the other parts of life, you know, family and and financially as well, right? I mean, you kind of... And those things are important to you yeah, or, or at least on the radar? Yeah, you definitely. Know, you, you run into a lot of guides in their 20s and they're like, I, you know, I don't want kids. Obviously, a lot of that changes. So you had that site though back then that you knew that you wanted to have financial stability and a family absolutely cool yeah. and what happened next i was guiding in argentina and a guy came as a guest and he had bought the trip at an auction didn't know how to fish and you know cal Toppen is a place where especially then because it, w- it was fishing really really well at that period in, in time you know there was a waiting list you didn't just show up and you definitely didn't come there for your first fly fishing trip and his name was bill ackman and i guided him for the week and he had never fly fished you know, first experience trout fishing was catching 20 pound brown trout. So it's kind of crazy. And at the end of the week, he just said, you know, you should come work for me. You would do great. And, and come work for him doing what? He ran a hedge fund in New York. And, you know, you've guided. As a guide, people often will offer things and you just never really know how sincere or how meaningful they are. And mm-hmm. didn't really think that much of it. But he was, he was intriguing. Like he's an interesting person. And I got back to Jackson Hole several months later, and there's a box in my house full of books and a letter. It just says, read these books and give me a call. And it was all kinds of financial books, like investing styles and, and things like that. So I shot him a note and said, thanks, why don't you come fishing? And, uh, you know, I was already booked for the summer. He declined the fishing. I guided all summer. I read all the books, and I called him in the fall, and he flew me out to New York, and I decided to stay. That is incredible. Yeah. How long does that last for? So I spent two years in New York. Uh, as an analyst for Pershing Square, which is a huge hedge fund, and I was the only investment team member that didn't have an Ivy League MBA education. He, I would imagine he didn't offer this to that many people. You know, he's notorious for kind of picking up eclectic people around the way, but mm-hmm. but certainly there's always kind of one in the mix, and I, you, I was the one at the time. Did you ever ask him what it was about you that he wanted? No. What do you think it was? Well, you I know you're humble, but yeah. what do you think it was? Well, you know, there was one thing where I started on the 1st of December in 2005. And so I'd been in New York for a couple of weeks and, and could kind of, this is a great 
kind of just anecdote that kind of will show my personality and Bill's because he's a really amazing person. So he calls me in his office after two weeks and he's like, well, how's it going? I was like, you know, I'm lost. You know, I don't know. How, I don't know anything. I literally just walk around with a legal pad, writing things down that I don't understand. And I stay up and teach myself. Like that, that's what I was doing. And his comment was, listen, you're a smart guy and I think you're a good thinker. And everybody else here is trained to think the same way. And you're going to have a different perspective. So I just want you to read and tell us what you think. And that's it. He's like, and you'll add value and all the finance stuff that you don't know, you'll learn along the way. And, you know, that kind of took a lot of pressure off and kind of put it in context of what, what the real goal was there. And then at the same time, he asked me how New York was. I was like, you know, New York's crazy and it's really expensive. Yeah. And he was like, well, how much am I paying you? I was like, I don't know. Right. So, I mean, I had. So, you took the job without knowing what you were making? Without ever having a conversation. So, like, I sold my drift boat, sold my truck, moved to New York, and I'd been there for two weeks. And then we have a conversation about, about salary. And he gave <laughs> And so, so he gave me a little starting bonus. He's so, he's like, he's like, well, I'm going to give you 10,000 bucks, get settled, and, you know, get a nicer apartment because I told him I was living. And he was like, that's no. not going to work. So, <laughs> yeah. but I remember, you know, it's like the middle of December and leaving the office that day and call my mom and be like, you won't believe what just happened. Right. right. I mean, the guy just gave me ten thousand dollars. I don't know anything. When is right? she like, are you involved in the illegal activity? Yeah. <laughs> what is she so, thinking during all of this? You know, I've always been doing weird stuff. My parents are still getting used to it. <laughs> okay. And so, you know, I spent a couple of years in New York doing that. And, you know, my personality is such, I mean, New York was hard. I had a really hard time with the adjustment. Um, but once I did, it was a great experience. I love the city. You know, I love the job. Were it's you a, good at the job? I don't know about that, but I got to where I was competent at least and could like add value and like justify being there. Things. Um, it's a unique firm. You know, hedge fund is a big nebulous term and people can do lots of things and call themselves hedge funds. But at Pershing Square, it's a, it's a deep value fund. So it's very research intensive. So most of what you do is read and do all this analysis and throw things away, right? I mean, really, you're only looking for one or two ideas a year. And uh. then they would deploy a lot of money when they found something they liked. They buy a big, big piece of it. Did you have a steady income? Yeah. I mean, I had a, you know. Salary? Yeah. I had Did, a salary and a bonus. And How'd that feel compared to being a fishing guide where you're hustling and banking for half of the year? Yeah. I, I mean, it's a totally different thing. Just a very structured, rigid life and... That's like the only time in my life I've had that. And there's a lot of value there, you know, health insurance and 401ks and here's how much money you have to spend every month. And there's a big bonus at the end of the year. And, you know, we had a gym in the office, so we'd have investment meetings in the gym. And so it's like in great shape and, you know, just in, a, in very much a routine um, work prior to that and, and my current life or nothing like that at all. Did you realize then, you know, I need to invest money for my future, especially if I am going to leave this job and go back into guiding? Sure. Absolutely. I mean... Part of the decision was I didn't want to be on that path, but I didn't want to just be a fishing guide. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to be in the middle of that where I could be outside and have the adventure and the exploration and, and the fishing and do all of that stuff. But, you know, I wanted to be able to make a real living. Do you think that's something that's really missed in this industry? It, I also am huge into investing and have been from a super early age. And I don't know if I would have had the confidence to dive into my career. I know I wouldn't have had the confidence to dive into my career the way I have if I didn't have money waiting for me in case it all goes to hell. Do you think that that's something that guides really need to, you know, consider for their future? Uh, I think you would be able to attract better talent for longer periods of time if you do. And I spend a lot of time now kind of advising and helping, you know, other fishing guides of just how to be kind of more professional, not necessarily just as a guide, right? There's lots of great guiding, but like how to help structure, structure your career so that you can do it forever. Would you mind giving a couple of pieces of advice right now? Yeah, I mean, almost everything's kind of one-off, right? I mean, just giving everybody's scenario is a little different, right? If you're guiding in Florida where you can guide 180 days a year, 200 days a year, it's a very different life than if you're guiding in Jackson Hole where, you know, you're going to do 100, 110. And I really always encourage people to be an entrepreneur and kind of take the risk because, you know, with the risk comes the upside. And with all of that, it's, it's really not about taking the risk, but it's understanding kind of that worst case scenario. How do you put that safety net in place so that if that fails, where are you going to end up and how do you pick yourself up from there? And a lot of that's just conceptual of just understanding those things and then, you know, getting comfortable. I think most people just have a hard time getting out of that comfort zone and taking that risk, which, which if you really understand it, it's not that, not that bad. If you had to, you know, look at the, the average amount of money that you suggest for people to put away monthly, are you comfortable throwing a number out there? I, I just, you know, as much as you can. More of what I would say is try to figure out how to leverage their talents to, to extract more value. So if you're just guiding year round and you're taking your day rate and you're taking your tip, 
Right. But you're also collecting these stories and you're making these content and, um, people have incredibly personal relationships with their guides. So one of the things I really encourage people to do more of are hosted trips, right? Everybody has a down season. You have all these loyal clients who not only enjoy spending time with you, but they also want to help you. And kind of one thing you can do, which will make you a better guide and a better angler and more interesting is to go travel to all these other places. And that hosted trip model as a lodge owner is great for all parties involved. It's, it's great a for win, win, win. Yeah. It's great for the lodge. It's great for the guide. Guide makes a little bit of money in the off season. His clients are happy. He kind of slowly that relationship a little bit. So I do, you know, I try to help a lot of guides figure that out and make it easier for them and try to show them the value and encourage them to keep doing that. What was the thought process when you thought, or when you made the decision it was time to leave that world? You know, it was really uh, a kind of an interesting kind of moment in life because my personality is such that I, you know, I, I like to be good and I like to be successful. So, I mean, I got to New York and very much tunnel vision, you know, I'm just kind of head down and focused and and doing things. And so I'd been there for a couple of years and Bill called me in his office and said, listen, you're doing great. I'd like you to go to business school. And then I'd, you know, come back to work, which made perfect sense. And they were going to pay for it? Yeah. So. What'd you say? Yeah. I said, okay. So, so you went back to school? No. So I, I sat there <laughs> and I wrote my application to go to business school. And it's that process that really kind of, if you do that, or if you write an application to go to business school, it is a very, very reflective moment. I mean, the questions are all geared towards why would business school help you in your career? Who do you want to be? Why do you need this? And, and you're connecting all those dots. And it was that moment of being able to step back from where I was, of being deep in the trenches and just trying to catch up with all these other guys who were so incredibly smart that I was able to step back and be like, you know, maybe this isn't what I want to do. But I wrote my whole application and went back to Bill and had it and told him I didn't want to go. And he's like, well, what do you want to do? I was like, I want to get back outside, but I want to be more than a guide. And I'd like to figure out how to make a living doing doing that. And he he's incredible. He just said, okay, great. He's like, now you know how to value businesses and do those things, so go find something. He's like, and you put up whatever you have. He's like, and I'll backstop the rest. What? So that's how I ended up in the Bahamas. I took everything I had. I bought a piece of dirt. And called Bill, and he he invested and made up the difference so that I could do the project. This is just a cool story. Yeah. Wow. Now, what year was that? That would be two thousand and seven, eight. Okay. So, how did that process go? And 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 why there? Why did you think that that was going to be where you were going to buy your piece of dirt? <clears throat> well, that you know, the lodge wasn't necessarily where I started. So to begin with, I was looking at every fishing company that was for sale. I mean, from manufacturers of, you know, rods and flies and clothing, and they were all just terrible businesses, right? Everybody (laughs) who wants to own these things, they own them for the wrong reasons, and they trade at stupid multiples. And so I was actually really disenchanted because I'd I'd looked at all these things that were for sale. I was like, man, this sucks. This isn't going to work. And then there was actually a Alaska fishing lodge that was for sale and was listed in the Wall Street Journal. So at that time in my life, I was reading the Wall Street Journal every day, fishing lodge in Alaska for sale. So I started doing a business plan on that business. Oh. So I flew up to Alaska to look at this business, did the whole thing. And, you know, they have planes and you know, all these crazy assets. And, you know, it was really interesting and exciting. I was like, man, this could be really cool. And then when you really dug down, it was really scary. You know, they're, super scary. They're it was, it, was it remote access fly and only? Yep. So, yeah. No, no. You know, so you're only open for three months out of the year. You have all these planes that just sit the rest of the time. You know, you have to be like 85% full to break even. If you make any money, you got to be totally full. Fly in your fuel. When yeah. you look at it, I mean, we were talking, I was talking about buying the Dean once upon a time. You look at the numbers and you go, this is terrifying. You yeah. No, continue. so I mean, that, that's exactly right. So, I mean, when you can put a little, you know, kind of business acumen and take a, take a look. You're like, man, no one should own these things, right? They're, they're really risky. Did you think, well, if I'm a pilot, it might make sense? No. Just none of it made sense? None of it made sense. Okay. But uh, it also kind of triggered that I think there was some opportunity in that space, right? I'd guided in lodges and I'd traveled a little bit and I also loved saltwater and I loved the Bahamas particularly. And so I started looking there and it was interesting for a few reasons. One is, man, you're open for eight or nine months out of the year, not three, right? That's a big start. Uh, the great thing about fishing in the salt is if you can find the location in the right spot, you don't have to have permits or thousands of acres, right? You don't have to control to make things private. You just have to be in the right spot and you're going to fish this incredible public resource of the ocean. So you could have a much smaller footprint, both in actual, you know, dirt, but also in dollars. Bahamas also, you know, doesn't have income tax and some other things like that, which make it an interesting investment. They also don't let people who are not from there guide 
Was that really, did you have a moment of, oh, can I do this as an American? Yeah, you know, there's so many parts of the, of the business analysis to make it work, right? You can, you know, all those are solvable problems. And the, the foreigner investing and in guiding in the Bahamas has only really recently become a real big issue. You know, at the time, that was a less, less of a concern. Oh, okay. And the, the other thing goes back to that risk analysis, you know, which was, you know what, the worst case scenario is I own a waterfront home in the Bahamas. Like, even if the fishing lodge fails, it doesn't go to zero if I buy property well. And so that goes you know, goes back to how do you take a calculated risk? You know, I could go and put everything I had into buying a piece of property because I believe the property was worth more than I was paying. Yes. And regardless of the fishing lodge working or not. That changes everything. On the Dean, you don't own the property. You know, it's a million dollars is what they want. And it's, or wanted, it's sold since. But it's at least, you know, you're leasing the property so what you're you're paying a million dollars to for rod days? Are you going to pull in that much money? If you don't make your money back in, like how many years? You're a professional. How many years do you need to make your money back in for it to be a, a worthwhile or a smart investment? Yeah, less than seven. Yeah, that's what my accountant said. So I walked, but you didn't. So you bought the property. Yep. Wow, this is so cool. How much property did you buy? Uh, the one in Abaco is where I started, and it's you know three and a half acres. Did it have any structure on it? Yep. So it had. Been, it was a. The whole thing was crazy in that. You know, I'm kind of exploring and looking around, and I had hired a guide for the day, and we would leave from this boat launch. And literally within a couple hundred yards of the boat launch is this dilapidated building. And I was like, well, what is that? He's like, oh, it's this whole crappy hotel. It's been for sale forever. And, uh, you know, so there were structures, and it had been destroyed in a couple storms, and it was in really rough shape. And I had just read an article uh, about kind of negotiating transactions. And it, 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 the basic premise was, you know, if they're asking a million dollars and you offer 800, then you're going to settle somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. But if you were to come up with some obscure number that sounds like you have some reason for it, like, you know, 793,000, you know, some random number then it, it draws the anchor of the negotiation closer to your scale. And so, you know, I just read that and thought it was fascinating. That is so, the coolest thing. One of the coolest things I've ever heard. Yeah. Well, what's the psychology behind that? Uh, you know, it's the same reason you don't ever want to be the first one to offer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So, and so, you know, I called the people. They said they were non-negotiable, did a little bit more work. It had been for sale for like seven years. Mm -hmm. It was in terrible shape. Mm -hmm. And I offered like half of what they were asking under this premise of some obscure little number. And I just kind of forgot about it. I figured they would call back, we'd negotiate. And like, you know, five days later, they call and they just accepted it flat. That is one of the coolest things I've ever heard. So now, obviously, buying something that's run down, you have to invest time and money into fixing it up. Yeah, no, I went and lived there and did it. On your own? Yep. Are you a tradesman? No, so I am now. <laughs> you are now, right? Yeah. That's incredible. How long did it take? So, uh, you know, the plan was to do it in a year, like take a year and renovate and expand and do this whole thing. And it pretty much did take a year. So I, I moved there in October. The plan was to open the next fall, which kind of correlates with the normal kind of Bahamian bonefish season. But we'd been there a couple months, and and it was the very first year that ESPN was doing this show called Pirates of the Flats. Right. And so they called and said, hey, we're looking for a place to do a thing in the Bahamas. You know the Bahamas well. You know, what do you recommend? I was like, well, you know, I've got a new place I'm building. When do you want to film? They're like, in April. I was like, yeah, we'll be ready. So I just kind of jumped in and agreed to do something like that. And at the <laughs> same time, they... You know, they, just from various people talking, like all of a sudden Abaco popped on the radar, so they agreed to do this thing. We're going to film in April. I just kind of ramped up my whole timeline. So our very first guest were filming Pirates of the Flats. And what year was that? 2008. Wow. Now, were you single at this time? Yep. Uh, or 2009. So that would be April of 2009. Okay. And then what happens? You know, to go and do that, it's it's all encompassing, right? The lodge, it's just your life, right? I mean, just you get up and it, it's not a job as much as it is a lifestyle, right? You, you, you were just, guiding though? No. No. We just run the whole thing, right? I mean, I, you know, managed the whole construction project, yeah. trained all the people, you know, found okay. all the people, you know, I went and learned all the fishery and started training guides. I mean, did did it all all from scratch. And when did you meet your beautiful, Bo how do you say it, Bohemian? Bohemian. Bohemian yeah. wife. So early on, like during the construction thing, it's a little self-selecting, right? It's a small island. There's one stoplight. Okay. And so we had seen each other and, you know, she just shot me a note on social media, said, hey, we should get together. And honestly, I like blew her off for months because I just had no time, right? right? I just didn't have any free time. And then finally, as we opened up, you know, made time to kind of get together. That and is so cool. Now you have a beautiful son. That's right. And we'll get caught up to that. All right. So you were training guides. Was that hard? Train, train, train locals how to guide? Yeah, sure. I'd never guide in saltwater. I didn't know anything, right? I mean, I had to learn it all myself. You know, I had to learn oh. the area. I had to learn how to pull. You know, I had to 
figure all that stuff out myself as well. What would you call yourself these days? You know, I mean, I still do guide a little bit internationally, but mm-hmm. like even in the Bahamas, it was always about running the operation. It was about finding the people to do the things, right? I mean, the downside of guiding in something like that is you can only kind of touch the two people in your boat. Yeah. Right? When you can kind of oversee the whole thing, you can help manage the experience for everybody there. Did you start another lodge? Yeah. So the whole thing was really complicated in that found Abaco, decided to partner with Nervous Waters, who owned Kaltoffin that I used to work for. Okay. They owned Bears Lodge already in the Bahamas, which was my favorite place. So we worked out a deal where gave them ownership in Abaco, and I bought some ownership in Bears, and we partnered together in the whole thing. So there, there were two. And also, that, that gave me kind of an immediate connection to like all the booking agents in a back office. So I do all the invoicing and all the other stuff while I was on the ground. And so the lodge is still up and running, and yeah. you're open for business. Where yeah. can people go to find more information? Yeah, AbacoLodge.com, BearsLodge.com. Okay, let's talk about IndieFly. Yeah. What is it? So IndieFly is really, of all the things I do, right? I mean, to make a living fishing, it means you do lots of things, just yeah. like you. Yeah. Um, but that's my favorite project. And it's, it's the only project I don't actually make anything from. I mean, it's a totally volunteer thing. But it's a full 501c3 that Al Parkinson and I co-founded with the mission that we think that you can take fly fishing as a tool to help indigenous people around the world kind of create a local economy that is both sustainable where they can eat and make a living. And as a result, you know, they will become conservationists and protect their land. And you guys started that 2004? No. Or nine? Uh, yeah. So in 2010, okay. I went to Guyana. Uh, oh. Al was working at Costa. He sent me down to Guyana to kind of go check out and try to figure out how to catch these arapaima. Uh, oh, and okay. going down there, really, when we went down just kind of on, on a fishing exploration, have a good time trip, and became enamored with the people and the place. And, and from that, that is where Indie Fly was born. So we went to Guyana, had a great time, loved the people, decided that this would be something that could help them implement it to start working on it. And, and then from that, decided, hey, this is a footprint that we can replicate around the world. So let's form a nonprofit where we can take this model and, and expand it so what in is other the, places. the model, though? Like, how does the it mod- work? Yeah, so when you look at remote indigenous people in the world, they generally have one thing of value, and that is their land, right? They have this one asset. And as the capitalistic world encroaches, they have to all of a sudden figure out how to move away from subsistence, barter economy, living. And the only thing they really can monetize is their land. And that's almost always detrimental. Right. And in the case of Guyana, they could have sold the timber rights, they could have sold the mining rights, and you watch all these other communities through the rainforest get destroyed and their way of lives destroyed as they sold the mining rights and they sold the timber rights and then they couldn't make a living. They got paid once. But they're also almost definitionally very in tune with the natural world. Right. So in Rewa in Guyana, you know, they were anglers, right? If they, if they wanted to eat, they had to go catch fish. And so they knew where the fish were and we could teach them to fly fish. And if we take that lodge model and let the community own it, where the community benefits economically, and you employ the people from the community, you just train them and teach them how to do the job, then all of a sudden they can eat, they can make a living, and then they will protect their one asset that they have, which is this land. And so for the case of Guyana, you have a village that owns 200 square miles of rainforest that is now kind of protected in perpetuity because the whole village can be employed by taking people fly fishing. Are there any other programs out there like that? I mean, I hear of projects that do that. You know, I've got friends who've done similar things, but not a not an actual organization that does that. Yeah, not with the kind of the fly fishing kick that I know of. So what countries has this program been put into? Uh, so we, ha- you know, we're also early in the game. So mm-hmm. Guyana is still the flagship and kind of the one kind of true success story. And we've tried to do one in French Polynesia. We're trying to do one in the United States in Wyoming in the Wind River Reservation. Oh, cool. And then we have a whole list of things that we're going to work on tomorrow in our board meeting and try to button up and try to continue to expand this footprint as we keep growing and and raising money and figure out how to deploy it. Yeah. Now, we're here at ICAST. We're in Florida. You literally just got off of an airplane. You haven't slept (laughs) in probably days. Thank you. You're doing amazing. So that's what you're here for, for Indifly. Yeah. You know, uh, we do uh, an annual board meeting always here at at ICAST, so it's kind of a great reason to come see friends and then wrap it up, do a little bit of work and, and kind of put things back on the path. Now, when I saw you last year, I was pregnant and you and your wife were what, a week? Were you guys a week behind me or a week in front? Yeah, we were really close. So our original due date was November 28th. Okay. And we were December 4th. When yeah. did Huck come? December 6th. Oh, wow. And she came on this. Uh, no, I was due December 5th. Yeah. She came December 4th. Yeah. So really close. Talk to me about being a dad 
people are always like, oh, what's it like being a mom? But I very rarely get to sit down with new dads like this. What sort of changes have you been going through? Yeah, it, it's... First and foremost, you <laughs> understand like why people keep saying all these cliches because they immediately become true and relevant and and all of that. And it's also just an immediate kind of game changer of priorities and things like that. You know, I thought that I could just kind of keep doing what I was doing. And, uh, you know, obviously to some degree I, I will and can. But at the same time, I went and kind of culled everything off my calendar that I could, right? And kind of makes me a little bit more focused about where I allocate my time because I want to kind of be around more. Yeah, but it's not like you're stuck at home in the living room. No, no. I mean, you know, the, I don't have a lifestyle where I can be stuck anywhere. No. So, you know, we're in, we're nomads and we just left the Bahamas. We just flew back to North Carolina, which is home. Uh, Beth and Huck will be there for the month and they're going to come join me in Wyoming. We'll spend a few weeks out there. I just read the most wonderful piece. I don't know if it was an article or what it was that you'd written just about how having a son has made you want to really show him, you know, your roots and where you were from. That was really refreshing to read that. Do you feel like you're looking at life through different eyes these days? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think the whole focus of life uh, shifts, right? It's no longer about me being on my own adventure and what, what do I want to do. But, you know, now I have this new little human that I want to help shape and create these incredible experiences for him. And, and those, in some ways, uh, you know, are parallel and, and in many ways are different, right? And part of that was, you know, kind of going back home and thinking of all the adventures that I had as a kid and kind of thinking that I was way out there and realizing, right, that I'm only, you know, a quarter mile from the house. And I thought I was way back in the woods doing all this crazy <laughs> stuff. Yeah. It's, it's all kind of relevant. You know, everything is really just kind of in perspective. And uh, so... I live in a wonderful part of the world that I generally neglect because I get so much adventure and coolness in, in the rest of my life so that when I'm home, I'm actually kind of just happy to be at the house. Yeah. Uh, and so now very much kind of excited to kind of get back out kind of where, where I grew up and what is home and, and kind of share that with both Beth, who I really have I've kind of neglected doing that as we've lived in the States for a couple of years, and certainly with Huck. How do you guys do it? Because now I obviously take Adelaide everywhere and I go hunting and fishing with her, but I'm mom. You know, for me, it's easy to feed her. The, her food's attached to me. What do you do? Does Beth have to go with you? Yeah, we. I mean, obviously, we prefer to travel together as much as possible. And generally, if I'm traveling for work, then she's staying home with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, Like day trips and stuff? Oh, yeah, we do that all the time. I think I saw a photo. Do you keep him on your back? Is he able to ride on your back at this age? We do both. It's kind of the mix of figuring out what works, right? So I've got yeah. the little front pouch and we. I picked up that little backpack thing. Beth picked it up at a, at a thrift store. So we, Do you like it? Or do you like the front better? You know, the back you can't see what's going on, right? So there's yeah. a little bit of both. So I think once he can get a little bit more where he can communicate, it, mm -hmm. that might work a little better. It's going to be so much fun. He's also heavy, right? So it's easier to carry him on your back. Yeah, no kidding. Do you think realistically that you could have a second one and still have the lifestyle that you want? Yeah, I mean, that's the plan. You guys are going to go for it. Yeah. I'm going to be watching you like a hawk. We're on the one and done train. Because I'm like, why are we going to ruin a good thing? Like, this is so perfect. Let's just, it's manageable. But I, I'm always saying to Charles, like, because he wants to now. And I'm going, I, I can't. I just can't. And work at the same time. So I have two brothers. And so, you know, I think, and Beth has three brothers. And so, you know, my siblings were, were so important in my life. And, and certainly now as an adult, you know, we're very close and hang out. And I just can't imagine growing up without kind of some a partner in crime. And Especially so, in that remote, like if you are going to be in the Bahamas, and I get it, oh, ooh, don't do it to me, Oliver. Yeah. I don't want to be tempted. <laughs> and two's good. There's two of us. We can each kind of grab one. I think it'll be fine. Yeah, cool. I'm excited to see what happens in your future. Um, you do have to get to, actually, this is going to be one of my shortest podcasts. Is there anything in particular that you're up to that you really want to talk about? I'm pretty open. You know, I, I feel like a real jerk because for me, you just kind of came out of the woodwork. You've been around for a long time, but... All of a sudden, it just felt like Oliver White was everywhere. And it would have been three years ago, three years ago, and all of a sudden your name, it just, everybody, oh, have you heard of Oliver White? Oh, did you see what the trip Oliver was on? And I'm like, who, the, who is this guy? Do you feel like your appearance in this industry just kind of smacked everyone from nowhere? You know, I don't, I don't know about that, but it, for me, it's really strange, right? Just like I never had any aspirations or intentions of being any what of a public figure. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I still, especially now, very much kind of wrestle with that. And it's really weird to kind of walk and see yourself on buildings and, and, and ads. And I mean, I can remember the first time that I was in a magazine, just thinking how crazy that was. And, um, 
and you know it gets to kind of just be normal and and really strange all at the same time. And, and I'm sure it's the same for you, man. I, I get a constant barrage of kind of inquiries from people like, man, how do you do it? You know, what's the key? And, uh, you know, I really don't know, right? I think a lot of it is just a little bit of luck and kind of timing. And part of it is just being you and being authentic, right? I was really, say, you seem to stay true to yourself. Yeah, I was just doing what I wanted to do, yeah. right? I mean, if it was something that I was into, then I was figuring out how to do it. And uh, it was a very selfish thing, right? I was just on my own path of, man, this is what I want to do and where I want to go. And these are the adventures I want to have. And from that, you start to meet other people. And I tell people all the time, you know, the most interesting people in the world and the people that I want to surround myself with are passionate people. And it really doesn't matter what they're passionate about, right? I mean, they can be a pianist and they can be an actor and they can be, uh, you know, an entrepreneur or a business owner and they can be guides and they can be whatever. But when people really love what they're doing, you know, they're, they're thoughtful and they're paying attention to the world and they're engaging and, and you can pick up so much from that. And kind of, I've done so many weird little things. I've picked up kind of a collection of these eclectic, but very passionate friends that I've learned from. And it's kind of helped me kind of stay really excited and passionate about what I'm doing. And I think that kind of rubs off and then it just kind of becomes this, you know, snowball effect. It just keeps going. Mm -hmm. How do you stay passionate about hosting trips? Like I hate it, but I also, you know, I, I don't hate it if I have six people who are really good friends of mine, but what happens when you have someone who wants to go on the trip and you don't know them? Yeah. You know, most of the time now, most of the hosted things I do are, are for people that are less clients and, and more great friends. And I do still, especially in, in, in being a lodge owner, right? I mean, there's lots of people there that I don't know that, you know, don't get vetted in, in any way that you have to take care of. But fly fishing is an incredibly good filter, I think. And so if you're going to choose to go on a fly fishing adventure, which is a self-imposed level of difficulty, which you almost definitely decided is not about the catching, and it's pretty expensive, then I think you generally attract a pretty good clientele. And in all the years I've done it, I could probably put on just my fingers the people that I would never, never talk to again. Right. And so I think that's pretty good. And I actually kind of miss guiding full time and I miss kind of being at the lodge full time just because of the inflow of people you meet. And I look back at all these incredible friends and people I have in my life that are all products of that, both from when I was guiding and also when I was just starting the lodge and the people that would come in and out of that. I mean, I've made some incredible lifelong friends and you know, a lot of people you forget about, man, but a lot of them, man, they're, they're almost like family now. Yeah. And I can see you attracting like really good people. I don't know what it is about you. I don't know if it's the beard. I don't know if it's the authenticity, but there's just something about you that looks like you draw in good people. You know, I haven't always had the beard. I think I'm going to have to lose it because it's becoming a thing. And that concludes this episode of Anchored. Thank you for listening. 